the interesting thing about um, the, the presentation we're doing today is when we started discussing this, it, it felt like the, the landscape around GPU checkpointing looked still different. And in, in the last three months, it has developed a lot. And it feels like we can present much more than we expected initially uh, when we started um, looking at this. And so it's, it's definitely um, the investigating um, what's, what's happening here. Um, so today's agenda will, will look something like this. I will give an introduction into Kubernetes checkpoint restore, crew, and, and how this works uh, without GPUs today, what's possible there um, currently. Then um, um, we will talk about um, what, why you want to do this with GPUs, why we think that's an interesting point where um, we, we wanted to look at. Then I will talk a bit about CRU and GPUs, what's today possible with what code does today exist and, and what, what can it do today? And then um, Nan will talk a bit about what we think should be done in the future or um, what are the next steps, maybe something like this. So introduction to CRU and <coughs> Kubernetes mainly without uh, GPUs at this point. This will also include a, a demo migrating a container from <coughs> Europe to a local VM here. I hope it works with the network. Um, so everything we're doing, um, talking about today is based on, on CRIU, a tool to checkpoint and restore processes. It's called Checkpoint Restore in User Space. And the reason, the, the name has, has a reason there. And so the, the history is Checkpoint Restore is a technology which exists in operating system and Linux for a long time. And um, in, in, in the early years, maybe 25 years ago, it was mainly used for high-performance computing because they wanted to ensure that the long-running simulations they have, that even if something crashes, that they can recover from it and don't start from the beginning. And, <clears throat> and initially, there was a, one of the implementation was an external kernel module, which was never merged upstream. Then there was uh, another tool which exists today, DMTCP, which uh, basically, as far as I know, works by Intercept, intercepting system calls, so it's basically doing an LD library preload, and then um, it intercepts system calls. <clears throat> Those um, implementations had a disadvantage that uh, they weren't what you call in checkpoint restore not 100% transparent. So you couldn't just, um, after the process is running, you could not say, oh, I want to checkpoint it. You had to know before starting the process that at some point you want to checkpoint it. So it was not totally transparent. So people were looking for another um, solution, um, how to implement Checkpoint Restore. And <clears throat> one of the implementations at the time, 2006, something like this, was an in-kernel approach to do Checkpoint Restore in the Linux kernel. It was a huge patch, patch set at the time, around 100 patches, touching almost every subsystem. And the community at that time didn't, didn't accept the, the patch set, and so it existed, it worked, but it was never merged upstream. And so from the in-kernel approach at that time, uh, user space approach uh, was the next one to try, and that's, that's CRIU. So CRIU was initially developed with, um, <clears throat> with, with the goal to be a complete, uh, a transparent checkpointing tool for, for Linux, and it wanted to use only existing interfaces. So it was using, um, existing information to get information from a pro running process and later restore the process as it was. Um, and the, the first uh, approaches worked uh, pretty good, so they continued working on, on this approach. And it was, um, and over the years, the CRIO developers added additional interfaces to the Linux kernel. The interesting thing about those additional interfaces, none of those interfaces are totally um, checkpoint restore specific. They can be used for other things. It's basically always, it gives you another interface to get information from a running process. And if you use that to later recreate a process, you have um, checkpoint restore. Um, <clears throat> CRIU is integrated over the year in many existing container runtimes, engines, orchestration, and the first one I, I want to mention here is OpenVZ, something I've never seen myself, never used myself. OpenVZ was doing containers before the name container existed, basically. And it was, it's not like the OCI containers from the day where you have an application level container, it's more like a system level container. It was a light, lightweight um, 
VM, you have uh, sysinit running there, you had SSHD maybe, you could, you could log in, it looked like the VM, but it was not a complete VM. And what they wanted to do for their users, customers, they wanted to be able to migrate those containers from one host to another host, and that's why um, they developed Creu. And the interesting thing about Creu here is Creu was developed for containers from the very beginning, and this is one of the big differences to all the other approaches. They were coming out of high-performance computing, and, and Creu is coming from container migration. That's also the reason why Creu is today, um, from my point of view, a really good use um, tool to migrate container from one host to another host or to checkpoint containers. Another interesting thing here I always like to mention is the integration of Creo and Borg. Borg is Google's container engine, which they use internally. Also something I've never seen myself, but um, Google came to us, Creo developer, Creo upstream developers, and they um, contributed patches, and they talked at conferences how they use Creu in, in Borg. And what they basically did before including Creu into their container orchestrator Borg was um, if a low priority container was running and some high priority task came along, then a low priority task was killed, and you had to restart from the beginning, which meant you lost the work of the, I don't know, last 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, as long as it was running. Today, um, those containers are migrated, so they are written to some central storage system and then uh, restored on, on s s some other node without losing the, the work to this point. Then there is integration in Lex Lex D today Incus um, of um, Creo. This also exists for, for a long time. They were really early adopters um, of, of Creo to migrate containers um, with the help of LexD. And then there is Docker. It's almost as long as the Lex D integration. Um, I started to work on, on Podman integration around 2018 to get um, Creo support into uh, Podman working. And the goal for why I started with Podman was I, I always wanted to um, make sure that Creo works with Kubernetes. And so my, my goal was to get it into Podman, then into Cryo, and from Cryo then add support to, to Kubernetes. <laughs> Sorry. And the thing is there, the, if you see Kubernetes, the, the, it has what, what it's called the CRI, the interface to the container engine. And so if you want to do something new in a container engine, you first have to convince the Kubernetes community to accept the feature. So, you have to work on, on both projects at the same time, and it requires a lot of um, um, coordination between the projects. So in Kubernetes today, um, it's possible to checkpoint containers, officially at least. Um, that's, that's what's officially possible. You can also restore it. So um, in Kubernetes, the, the checkpointing is available under the, the label for story forensic container checkpointing. And the idea was if you have a container running on your system <clears throat> and something suspicious is happening in the container, you have maybe a tool like Falco which detects something that something is might be going on with the container. Um, with forensic container checkpointing, you can create a checkpoint of your container without the container knowing that it's being checkpointed and it will continue to run. And now you have a stateful copy of your container and you can analyze it either offline but just by looking at the, the checkpoint files or you can restore the container in a sandbox environment somewhere else and and just keep it running without network access but you can start it as many times as you want and you have the possibilities to um, analyze it really deeply so um, <clears throat> the, the interesting thing about kubernetes basically is that there's a ticket from 2015, which was asking for um, container migration uh, for a long time. And I started working on the Cryo Kubernetes integration in 2020. It took me around two years to get it um, um, to alpha level in Kubernetes, in, which was available with Kubernetes 125. And in um, Kubernetes in the upcoming release 130, it will be beta. Beta means also that it's now enabled by default. So whenever you have Kubernetes 130 um, with a new version of, of Cryo and Containerd also has support for it with 
o, which should be out soon maybe. So um, you can always checkpoint your, your containers. Um, because it's under the label forensic container checkpointing, the container will always continue running. So you, it's not stopped because usually if you use CRE, you can decide I want to stop the container. It should continue, but in the Kubernetes uh, environment, it's always continues to run the container. So a um, couple of use cases I want to mention here is um, what people are really interested about for checkpoint restore, which also is part of the of the GPU um, um, story here is spot instances. So people can get cheap spot instances. And the problem is it goes away um, in a couple of minutes or seconds. And with the help of checkpointing, you can save the state of your container and then restore it in some other spot instance later. This is what people um, use in production today. Um, I've, I've heard from multiple companies which use this, use this today. And you can also use it um, just for migrating container. We, what we, I mentioned that it's only officially available as checkpointing, but what we do today in, in Cryo is we, we trick Kubernetes. So Kubernetes tells us, please start that container. And if this image is a checkpoint image, then Cryo will know, okay, I will do a restore and not just a simple start. For Kubernetes, it will always look like it's a new container, but in fact, it's a, it's, it's a restored container. Um, and now to the demo. So I, I just want to mention OpenHPC here because the demo is based on an OpenHPC container and I just want to thank the project to make it possible to travel here. Um, so let's see. So this is the right one. So this is a VM running in, in Europe at my home and I want to start a container in Kubernetes here. I can look here, okay. It's working here, but not here, okay. Um, so this is, this is a really simple definition of a container. It's just a, a stateful container, kubectl. Ah, the network is too slow, sorry. kubectl apply, no. There it is. Okay, the container should now be running and now I can um, talk to the container using curl. And, and what it does, the container, it just calculates a, a value of pi and you see the, the difference is, um, is the distance. So the closer we get to the original value of pi, the, the, the smaller um, the distance will get. And so this is a, a stateful container here. Now I, I can create a checkpoint the checkpointing is currently a kubelet only interface, so it's, it's not uh, available via kubectl. There exists a pull request for that, but currently it needs to be called from, from the kubelet directly. So we have a tool to analyze um, checkpoints. This was written by two Google Summer of Code students last year, and it basically tells you this is the container named pi. The image it's based on, the runtime it's based in, one it was checkpointed, which engine, the IP address, the checkpoint size is basically all the memory pages. And then the root FS diff style is the files which have changed on the container since the last time as uh, compared to the base image. And now I will convert this checkpoint archive to an, um, to an OCI image. I don't, I don't know, I don't see it here anywhere. Oh, no. Sorry. Um, and now I, I will just push it to a, to a registry so that we can restore it somewhere else. And I will take another name so that it's new. And now it will be pushed to a registry. 
and basically the container image size is just the size of the memory pages. Okay, the other part will be a, a bit faster because that's running locally. So now I will use that um, checkpoint image. So it was 55. I will say apply and I hope it will pull down the image quickly. Pulling, pulling, pulling. So now the container is running and now I can talk to it. And now it continues to run at the point. Uh, so the demo was, was a bit slow. That's, um, but at, at least, so we did a stateful migration from Europe to Seattle um, of our container um, without, losing, without losing the state. Okay, now it's your turn to the GPU part. Yeah, thanks Adrian for uh, the great light demo. Uh, so as people have already benefited from the checkpoint and restore tools for traditional CPU applications, checkpoint and restore with GPUs also offers a lot of advantages uh, in terms of quick startup, fault tolerance, and efficient GPU uh, resource utilization. For example, AI and machine learning workload usually have complex initialization setup and uh, specialized hardware like uh, C uh, GPUs or TPUs may require sophisticated initialization or and uh, configuration. So with GPU checkpoint and restore, the intricate process of initializing complex state can just occur once by checkpointing its state. And subsequently, numer numerous workloads can very quickly boot up by resuming from the checkpoint image with all configuration and setup in place. And uh, another use case is HPC long running applications often have execution time ranging from days to months. Larger execution time can make the occurrence of faults during the runtime more likely and increase the cost of restarting applications that have to re-execute to regain their computational progress. So by creating backups and preventing loss of work done by stateful workloads, GPU, work, uh, GPU checkpoint and restore can um, ensure the continuous, continuity of GPU intensive tasks and offers a lot of efficiency in GPU resource utilization. And GPU checkpoint and restore has been a popular research topic. Several approaches have been previously proposed for VDA GPUs, like uh, Heater checkpoint implements uh, application level checkpoint restore schemes that stores the checkpoint firstly on device memory and copies it to the main memory by using hardware support. And Singularity aims to drive down the cost of AI by maximizing the accelerator capacity globally. It proposed a device proxy approach uh, by intercepting the driver API calls for VDA GPU checkpoint and restore support. With a similar concept, Crackit implements a virtualization layer for um, remote, remote execution and checkpoint and restore for CUDA applications. And then Crack is another proxy-based solution that supports transparent checkpointing for CUDA without using inter-process communication in order to reduce the runtime overhead. So although um, checkpoint and restore for CPU applications is already well established, it's still quite challenging uh, to enable checkpoint and restore with GPUs. It is because of uh, the more complex structure of GPU devices and the fact that much of the software for the interaction with applications is proprietary, so not allowing complete access. And also um, some proposed solutions lack of transparency to developers and still have high runtime overhead. So I will pass it back to Adrian and um, he will talk a little bit more. So <clears throat> after the introduction, you know, let's, let's see what can we do today. <clears throat> so Creo and GPUs. So um, generally speaking, Creo can basically checkpoint most processes which are running on your Linux operating system today. The problem starts as soon as an external device um, is being used. An external device is something which is not directly used by the kernel, which is accessed um, directly via IOCTOS or I, I don't know, some, some device. 
Common devices here are InfiniBand devices, GPUs, accelerators, FPGAs. All those devices have the problem that they have an additional state which CRIU doesn't know, and the additional state is needed, needed during restore to be able to, to restore the, the process. And um, so it's necessary to get the state from the external device also written to, to local disk to be able later to restore it on, um, <clears throat> on, on another system or make multiple copies of it. And um, CRIU luckily has an interface um, that enables that and it's, it's what we call the CRIU plugins. CRIU plugins, they basically give you a hook. When CRIU detects an open device it cannot handle, then the plugin can handle that device. And <clears throat> luckily, uh, a couple of years ago, AMD um, approached a CRIO upstream project and developed uh, uh, um, a plugin to handle um, AMD GPUs. So today it's possible to checkpoint and restore processes which are running on AMD GPUs. The thing, uh, this is probably my point of view, is um, I think the, the plugin to handle a certain device can basically only be written by the, by the vendor of the device because you need so much knowledge about the internals of the device to be able to checkpoint the information and, and later restore it that it feels, at least for devices like InfiniBand and GPUs, maybe for an FPGA it's probably different, but um, it needs the help of, 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 of the vendor of the device to, um, to enable it. Um, and this brings us to the, to the demo, what's possible with CRIU and GPUs today. So this is a recorded demo, so it will work probably a bit better. So what we will see here is we will uh, create a checkpoint. Um, we will we'll start a container uh, using Podman uh, with, uh, with the AMD GPU. Then we will, um, let's, let's start a container here. So the first step is we are showing that nothing is currently running on the GPU. Um, then we will start the container, then we will see that something, that the container is running, then we will see that something is running in the GPU, you see the GPU is in use of uh, 77%. The next step is we will create a checkpoint of the, um, of the container, then again, this is the tool I also use, the checkpoint control will give you information about the checkpoint archive which was just created. Additionally, to the, to the information we've seen before, we now see the size of the, of the GPU checkpoint which was created um, during um, container checkpointing. Um, now we should see that nothing is running on the GPU anymore because we created a checkpoint. Yeah, so you see it's now 0% usage to the GPU. Then we will make a restore of the container. The con uh, application will continue to run. The GPU is in use just as before. So we were able to um, checkpoint and restore um, a process running with code on the host and on the GPU using uh, Podman and CRIU today. So this is something which already exists today. And basically this is uh, with the help of one of those plugins I mentioned, mentioned before. The same is also pod, uh, possible with um, Kubernetes. So we, this is just showing the checkpointing. But if you have a um, Kubernetes container running, with an AMD GPU, it's the same container as before. The, the checkpointing tool today also is possible to checkpoint that container. Um, let's see it here. Yeah, and it's the same as again. Again, the checkpoint control tool just to show you the information about a created checkpoint. And that's, um, that's the demo about AMD GPUs. And let's get back. This is the wrong slide. Here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, as you have uh, seen, um, GPU checkpoint and restore is still um, in early stage. There are a lot of opportunities in this area. Some companies and uh, projects are already working on GPU enabling GPU checkpoint and restore with CRIU. 
as, men uh, as Adrian mentioned, uh, the implementation of AMD GPU plugin is already available within Creo Repo, and uh, Project Crack It uh, continues exploring new approach approaches that don't have to be limited to proprietary software and hardware, and etc. And uh, as um, open source projects, their implementation is mostly transparent to developers. So people are encouraged to contribute and improve without uh, restrictions. And also a few startup companies has also started to uh, support GPU checkpoint and restore with CRAYU. Like Sidana was founded in 2023 uh, and it supports seamless workload migration across machines, GPUs and clouds. And Memorge uh, partnered with Vidya to develop uh, to develop a utility within CUDA driver to allow GPU checkpoint and restore by using Creu. They also showcased um, how GPU workloads can be automatically hot, uh, hot restarted after pod queue or eviction e uh, events in the latest KubeCon. So expect you to see uh, the the latest uh, CUDA driver with the utility released by Vidya sometime this year. And Microsoft is also working with AMD and the uh, Vidya to enable GPU checkpoint and restore in handling large scale training and inference workloads. For example, uh, Project Forge uh, is a containerization and global scheduler service, which introduces transparent checkpointing and is internally used by GitHub Copilot under the hood. So Microsoft is, uh, is going to continue focusing on uh, optimizing GPU utilization, reducing the checkpoint overhead, and enabling seamless migration of GPU accelerated AI and ML applications. Um, for people who are interested in video GPU checkpointing, there is a, a CRAYU issue that tracks the latest changes and updates within CRAYU repo. Uh, so people, uh, you can check it out for more information. And some open areas uh, still exist uh, that include uh, the integration of GPU checkpoint and restore to the whole container stack, like Kubernetes, uh, container runtimes, and et cetera. Security also needs to be considered, like how to enhance the data protect protection during the checkpointing and migration processes. Currently, uh, for CPU level checkpointing, some efforts has been done to protect the sensitive data in container checkpoint. Uh, the, and the support for encrypted images is being proposed uh, within Creu repo. For GPU checkpointing, there are still a lot of opportunities for developers to contribute. So uh, thank you for joining the talk today and uh, we still have a couple minutes for Q&A. Yes, please. Yeah, so like, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I totally got like, what's the, uh, like are there, are there production use cases that are doing like, like um, restore on GPU containers? So like, I'm, I'm about what size, like two gigs, less? So this is only the view from, from upstream Creo. So we had contact, like I mentioned with AMD they said they, they did it because the customer was requesting it and all the things we know about NVIDIA is something which NVIDIA hasn't talked to Creo upstream at all. So we, we don't know what NVIDIA is doing. We just see news popping up. They mention Creo explicitly, so it seems to be the tool of their choice, but um, we are not aware that anybody is using it in production and, and talking about it. So we know about startups interested in it because they think it's a, a useful thing. So they, they talk to us, those startup companies. We see research projects doing it. And, and, and since a couple of months, um, especially with all the AI, AI, AI hype, um, people are all of a sudden really interested in, in Checkpoint Restore with, with GPUs. So um, it's, it's mainly, currently the problem is that, that that NVIDIA is not talking what they do really, so. Um, how finicky is it when it comes to restoring a workload? Does it have to be exactly the same GPU? Um, you know, so like if you move a workload from Amazon to, a, a, you know, in, in house or something like that, would it have different set of GPUs that need to do that or? Are you gonna... 
So um, if you look at, at, at what um, is possible with CPUs, you basically can only migrate to newer CPUs that works. With GPUs, I guess it's even more complicated because between generations, at least what I know from NVIDIA, they, they, they change a lot. So it's, from my point of view, it would, would not be possible. So if you're inside the same generation, um, maybe, but I, do, I doubt it between generations because it, the, the architecture changes too much. Uh, Do the pods you start with like a new name or an IP address? Are there any difficulties with that? The pod restart. <clears throat> when you launch it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, as I, as I told before, for Kubernetes, it's a complete new container. It doesn't know it's a checkpoint. So it's a new pod, it's a new pod UID, it's a new, a new everything. It's just um, the container name stays the same, but everything around it, we, we adapt. So, so basically, we get the information from Kubernetes that Kubernetes wants to create a container, and then we look at the checkpointed container, and then we adapt all the metadata to match the, the, new, um, the new pod and the new um, infrastructure. The thing about um, IP addresses is um, we've seen um, the GPU case with Podman. So, so if we do a migration with Podman, the IP stays the same because the network setup, when I implemented it, the, the network setup for Podman was much simpler. So it made sense. If I want to migrate a process with, with open TCP connections and then I keep the the, um, the IP address because then it then it works if the TCP timeout doesn't kick in. But if if it's fast enough, then you can migrate from one host to another, and you have the um, the network set up in such a way. With uh, Kubernetes, I, I haven't touched that at all because I don't know the network side from Kubernetes good enough, and it feels like it's a really complicated thing, and it can be in many different. There are so many things which can do network in Kubernetes that it's, uh, it feels, I, I'm not convinced it makes sense. So if you, if you checkpoint a pod which has connections between um, containers in the same pod, assuming they have the same network namespace and they use localhost to communicate, then I guess this should be doable. But as soon as you go outside, um, it probably gets difficult. There's a Google Summer of Code project this, um, this season. There's the, I, I don't know, there's the P4 compiler, which does network compile stuff. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how it works, but um, they have a Google Summer of Code project which wants to do exactly that. So you <clears throat> migrate a, a pod from one host to another host, and at the same time, you make sure that the, all the network address translations are also handled correctly to enable um, TCP established connections to migrate. Yes, please. Yeah, so so we we haven't haven't tried a restore in, in Kubernetes. We we were uh, afraid that it will not work, so we we didn't try it. But. The thing is, we know it works in Podman, so the expectation is it's it's not a technical problem. It's just you have to implement it and do the right metadata fix up, things like that. Yes. What was the last part? What about? For example, if I have that uh, you know, machine learning training yeah. uh, running inside this container, so what about the accuracy before that? I need to change it to that accuracy. I, I, I don't know what accuracy is in context of machine learning, sorry. Okay. That's Uh, hello, uh, I got two questions. So like first one, uh, so for CPU use cases, probably uh, the way we ensure like no more data, no more new data is being uh, being like generated is by maybe setting the freezer C group and make sure like it's paused and then we can just take the memory pages and stuff. 
And for for GPU uh, scenario, like even we, if we change the uh, freezer C group, ensure like no process running right now, uh, can we be hundred percent sure like no new, new data is being generated on the C GPU and or the external uh, FPGA's device? And uh, the second question I got is like, uh, is all the data on the GPU is being checkpoint stored into a new image layer and pushed into registry? And is it gonna cause like the restoring or like the uh, the cold start booting time of the new container to have a larger latency? Cause like maybe previously the data they are stored externally, maybe on a volume or a cloud disk. And now you're storing all this GPU data, which might be large in the use case of the uh, machine learning stuff. And in my, my, uh, like everything will be in the root app, root app best. It's probably gonna take longer time. Like how did you manage this external data? Yep. So the first question was something about 100% and no. Um, and um, so, so yes, for, for, how, uh, for CPU, we use uh, the C group freezer basically to, um, so currently we only do um, container checkpointing. We don't do pod checkpointing. I did pod checkpointing before that's, that's it's an easy thing in the end to do. It's just you you do a loop over all containers, collect some metadata about a pod, and then you can checkpoint and restore the pod. That's 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 easy to do. Um, and then you would do the C group freezer over the whole pod, right? Um, if you have a GPU with it, I I actually don't know how how it currently works. Um, if um, this is maybe something which which is which is a problem. You're right because. Even if we stop the, the C group, if you use the C group to stop the process, we don't know what, what's happening on, on the GPU. So we need additional synchronization here to make sure that the GPU stops at the same time at, as, <clears throat> as, the, as the host process, you're right. The second question was about the size. Um, the size. So, I know one of the big problems AMD had when they initially developed it, it was the time to write the data. They, they, they put a lot of effort um, into their code to be able to dump the data to disk as fast as possible. And I've seen demos of big uh, GPU containers from, from AMD and it's, it's really, really fast what they do there. So they, they can um, checkpoint it, it really in, 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 a, in a short time. So, so the checkpointing is fast. The restoring is slower, you're right, because you need to read more data. But uh, I think it's, it's just um, probably just if you have a large um, CPU only process with a lot of data, then it will take time to read that data. And if you have it for the GPU, then it will probably be the same, same time. I, I don't think it will be extra much, much longer than uh, the, 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 the CPU case. Sorry, I, I, I got one more question. So like, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in like checking, ch checkpointing the uh, container in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, so like in Kubernetes, like m mostly we use the OCI image and with the overlay, right? And and when we are checkpointing a layer, uh, like a container, we're just creating a new layer of the the image, right? And so this layer is gonna contain both the root FS and the... No, no, no. So this, this was one of the ideas that came up initially, but what we do, we the, the checkpoint image just contains the memory pages, the registers, and everything to recreate a process. It contains all changed files to the base image. And then we have a reference to the base image. So we don't combine it, but the container runtime will see, okay, we need that base image. I will pull that if I don't have that. And then I will apply that checkpoint on top of it. So we, it's separate images. You could probably also make, make it one image with additional layers, but currently we have the original image, which is untouched, and then we have the checkpoint image, which only the checkpoint with a reference to the original image. Yeah. 